Another McRae miracle as Collingwood pips Port Adelaide in a top-of-the-table thriller. Plus, Brisbane keeps its top two hopes alive against Geelong and Charlie kicks 10 as Carlton surges into the top eight. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. This is the round so far brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, only one place we can start tonight. That's at the Adelaide Oval where we saw an absolute thriller between Collingwood and Port Adelaide. Well, you knew it was coming, but it happened again. <laughs> so Collingwood come from 17 points down at three quarter time. And here's the moment, the relief, the players celebration. Taylor Adams is game number 200. And you can see what it means to them. The amount of belief and connection in this group is mm. Something that we haven't seen for a while, incredibly well coached. They know what to do in these scenarios. They kicked the first one of the last quarter. That yep. got them going again, and there was some brilliant individual heroics for the Pies tonight. You just knew when Steele Sidebottom put that goal through a minute into the last quarter to reduce the margin to 11 points that the Pies were coming. It was just such an incredible finish to this game, though. Back and forth in the final term, an instant classic. And these are some of the big moments of that last quarter. So we mentioned side bottom kicks the first. McCreary here, how good is this? This is finals-like footy. So win a contested footy, break away, and then make a good decision going inside forward 50 to even numbers. That's the perfect spot to put it. Bobby Hill is important. Kane Farrell made some errors in the last quarter. That's got to go through a rush behind. And you bought, get the ball back. Instead, he goes straight to the boundary line. That's a free kick. Jamie Elliott kicked a couple in the last quarter, mm -hmm. three for the match. We'll get to his big moment shortly. Power Pepper has just been enormous for them. He's yeah. almost their most important player, and I say that spiritually. For what he gives them offensively, but also defensively in the physical presence. And this was a couple of centimetres away from going out <laughs> in the full. Instead, he marks it and goes back and slots it. He has done this so often. So that goal after the siren against Essendon last year, the goal in the dying seconds against Carlton in round 23 last year, and then he puts that one through with just over three minutes to go to win the game for Collingwood. Their fifth win this year, having trailed at three-quarter time. Have a look at that, Kane. That is remarkable. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I don't know how they do it. I was saying at three-quarter time, do you address that if you're Ken Hinckley yeah. and Port Adelaide? Or are you oblivious to it? And if you say it, does it make the players a bit nervous? But in the end, Collingwood started so well in the last quarter. You could sense it was coming. So to do that again after doing it already in round seven against Adelaide mm. at the Adelaide Oval, that yeah. ground hold no fears for them. But it did feel like the best two teams going at it tonight. Yeah. The best game did. I've seen this year, the, the finals like atmosphere, the pressure which we'll get to mm. in a moment, it just felt like a big final. And for me, I sit back and go, well, clearly they're probably the best two teams in it. They certainly were. As you mentioned, the pressure throughout this entire contest was just immense. Right from the get-go, they just... It was like a prize fight. They yeah, were just it was. bashing each other throughout and the whole you, night. You just feel like Collingwood are a little bit gettable if you can bring this pressure. So Port laid nearly 80 tackles. They mm. laid 15 to 2 tackles inside forward 50. And yet Collingwood made errors. Like they just delayed the ball. They were a bit confused. They coughed up handballs. And you can see here, and Port Adelaide were able to hurt them off the turnover. But equally, when yeah. the game was in the balance, Collingwood rose to the, that occasion as well. And their pressure was terrific. Thought the Pies got on top from stoppage in the last quarter. But efforts like this, this is what you build your game on. Yes, they've got the flair, they've got the individual class and brilliance, but you're not going to win anything in September if you don't bring this. Port Adelaide brought it, Collingwood matched it, mm. and in the end, could have gone either way, but Collingwood got it done again. A couple of remarkable stats for you, Kane. Of the last 16 times they've trailed at three-quarter time, they've won 12 of those games. They've now won eight straight at the Adelaide Oval. The last five have been within a kick as well, and they've won all five of those games. Does Willie Rioli have anything to worry about here? Because this strike off the ball to Nathan Murphy, he's already missed two games this year for a striking charge. Watched it a couple of times. It's pretty weak to me. I think Nathan Murphy milks that for all it is worth. You watch it, you put it in slow motion, it's an open hand that sort of rests on his chin. I'm surprised he went down that easily and mm. milked it that much. The fact that he did do that probably means that Willie is in trouble, yeah. but if he does get sided, I'll be taking that straight to the tribunal and go, I reckon Murphy milked that for all that it's worth. And 
Perhaps he's looking at a staging one. I reckon he probably gets one or two there, Rioli. Let's go to the Gabba now where Brisbane made it 10 straight wins on their home deck. They absolutely dominated this one out of the middle. They mauled them. They absolutely mauled them. I was so disappointed in what Geelong brought for three quarters. They flicked the switch in the last quarter, which we'll get to. But from stoppage and the way that they transitioned the ball, I haven't seen a Geelong side this flat. Mm. Now, the scoreboard in the end and the final margin is going to absolutely flatter Geelong because Brisbane were easily the better team. And if not for some errant kicks going inside forward 50 in the first quarter, the game essentially would have been over at quarter time. So I thought Geelong defended really well. I thought their defenders held up, led by Tom Stewart again, but it was this sort of stuff in the midfield. And the numbers were extraordinary from that. Um, the Lions midfield plus 39 in disposals. Uh, we'll, we'll get to and show you those numbers in a second, but the Cats just didn't have any effort at ground level yeah. and they were flat today. We've spoken about this a couple of times when throughout the season about when Dangerfield and Guthrie were out of this side, the midfield looked a little bit lightweight. Now, Brisbane had 14 of their 23 players that took to the field this afternoon. So this one here, look, the ball's bobbling around. Yeah. No one from Geelong, Cameron, no one wants to go and get it until Rainer goes, OK, I'll go and get it. And they'll burst away from stoppage and we'll go from back 50 to forward 50 and kick an easy walking goal. You didn't see that with Geelong last year. Geelong yeah. were the teams that were beating up on other teams. Now they're getting beat up upon. Mm. Now, they're going to get a lot of games at home, but it was a disappointing performance. And, and I haven't seen numbers like this as lopsided yeah. against the Cats for so long. So, disposals. First possession. Like, when the mm. hit-outs are reasonably even and you're plus 37 for Brisbane in first possession, smacked in contested possessions, plus 27 in clearances, got them done on the ground to the point where Chris Scott said at half-time, yeah. I'm going to put my best player who's taken six intercept marks mm. and put him in the centre bounce, Tom Stewart. Yeah. And that was a big you-know-what to his midfield. It was a big message to say, you guys haven't got it done, so I'm going to put Tom Stewart, who never plays inside, on ball. And he's actually pretty effective, but mm. if you're Chris and the midfield coach, Nigel Lappin at Geelong, I think it is, you'd be pretty disappointed with that effort from your mids. Spent a lot of that second half starting in the centre bounces, did Tom Stewart. As I mentioned before, 14 of 23 Brisbane players had clearances throughout the evening. One down point though for the Lions was a knee injury to Will Ashcroft. Now he's the rising star favourite going into this game. Chris Fagan saying after the game that it put a real downer on the evening for him. He doesn't know how bad it is. Fingers crossed that it's not an ACL but it didn't look great just given how innocuous it was. No, it's hard to speculate but it didn't look good. You can read the body language and you can mm. listen to actually both coaches after the game mention this and um, for what should have been a really you know, celebratory night for Brisbane mm. with, with them knocking off the Premiers and responding for last week. That is a sour note and, yeah, I'd be surprised if he plays for the rest of the year. I hope I'm wrong. Despite Brisbane's dominance, they only won by 11 points. Geelong made a comeback late, but the Lions ultimately getting the job done. Let's head to the MCG now where Richmond certainly made a comeback late. This is where we find our moment of the weekend. It was Liam Baker's goal that sealed a comeback from 30 points down at three-quarter time. They overwhelmed them, didn't they, in the last quarter? So five goals to zero in the last quarter. Hawthorne had this game in their control. I thought Sam Mitchell's coaching was excellent. Thought they you know, were able to possess the ball. High uncontested marks. Got one-on-ones inside 450. McGuinness on Rioli was another great move. But that player there mm. should be the next captain of the Tigers. And this is... This is bizarre footage. He looks away from the play. <laughs> so Dustin Martin gets the ball. Does he think about... it's a stoppage? I, I don't know whether he thinks it's a stoppage or whether he's going to set up behind the ball for that stoppage, but he looks away and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, hang on, we've won it, and the ball falls in his lap. There's some la luck in that, yeah. <laughs> and good players get lucky and they get lucky often, but there's also the brilliance to finish. And yeah. All of their big players stood up mm. in big moments late, I thought. You know, Sam Mitchell tried to protect the lead with Will Day behind the ball, which was effective. Sicily was just enormous with 10 intercept marks. And Hawthorne took so much out of that game, and yep. they were so good for so long. But the Tigers, in the end, were too good in the last quarter when it mattered. Well, 30 points up at three-quarter time were the Hawks before Richmond kicked 5-3 to two behinds in the final term. Here are some of these massive moments that you spoke about. But Matthew Coulthard, the mid-season rookie pick, came on off his bench and did a really good came job. Came on, him. gave them some speed, and kept hitting up Dustin Martin, then was following up, was getting the one-two, so the fresh legs that he provided. Revolt had an ordinary game and was dominated uh, by Sicily, but kicked that goal there. He missed a couple of easy ones, and then they just kept coming. One-on-ones in the goal square, Dustin Martin too good. He's always going to be too good in that situation. I thought their pressure 
Rose, this one, hat kick from Weddle, it's mm. always going to go to the opposition. And Taranto went back and kicked his third from outside 50. So some of those numbers in the last quarter were you know, clearly lopsided in favour of the Tigers. Contested footy, they lifted their pressure, tackles 20 to 11. Um, and a few key Hawthorne players that started the game really well, including Chad Wingard, went missing. James Sisley had 10 intercept marks for the night. Have a look at this. Their third biggest comeback from three-quarter time in AFL-VFL history. Their biggest since 1947. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was surprised by that. It didn't, didn't feel that big. But yeah. once they got their momentum, you know, the Tigers at the MCG, when that crowd gets behind them, then mm. they are an absolute force. They're not at their best. I don't think they're in the best eight teams in the comp, mm. but it's interesting that it kept their season and their finals hopes alive. So what did you make of it? Because on average, they were over three years older than Hawthorne. They had more than 50 games of experience on average per player than Hawthorne as well. Did you think that sort of told in the last quarter? Yeah, well, possibly the experience mm. probably hurt them as well. Lack of experience for Hawthorne and then the flip side for, for Richmond. But I think you walk away and go... Hawthorne are much closer to their next premiership than what the Tigers are. When you look at the experience and that graphic that we, you would show if, if we did about the age and also the games mm. played and the lack of experience at Hawthorne, to be able to match that with a really um, experienced side was a big plus for Sam Mitchell and I thought he coached exceptionally well. Let's head to Optus Stadium now where Sydney got the points over Fremantle. This was born from the first quarter. So the Dockers kicked the first goal of the game. The Swans kicked the next six straight to really take this game away yeah, from Fremantle. Yeah, what is going on from Fremantle? I mean, they're, they're, they are now, they're bottom four, but they're the third worst team in the comp. Hawthorne is a better side than Fremantle, which is alarming when you th think about the drop-off from winning a final last year and the way that they topped up through the trade period, yes, they lost a couple, but the heavy investment in Luke Jackson, which clearly hasn't paid off, and then they just don't turn up. Week after week, this footy club does not turn up. So you look at your leaders, you look at the mm. coach, and you go, what is it about the coach that he can't motivate this group to be switched on from the start? And you look at the captain, Pierce, which we'll get to shortly, but once again, plus 10 in disposals for the Swans in the first quarter. They beat them up around the contest. Nine more inside 50s in mm. the first quarter alone plus 25 in score, all the midfield numbers went Sydney's way. And we know when they compete and they win stoppage, Sydney are a good team and they're a tough team to beat. Lance Franklin among the best for the Swans in what could, could be his last game in his home state of WA. Three goals, two goal assists, six marks and three contested marks. Got the better of Alex Pierce, didn't he? Yeah, it's not ideal for the skipper to be beaten by a 36-year-old. I think it was an odd choice as, as Captain Pierce to, to have that mantle from full-back. Not often does he influence games. He's, he's been a handy lockdown defender, but he's not the captain. So they need to make that change at the end of the year, and it's got to be Sarong or Brayshaw. Once again, Sarong was, was huge tonight with 10 clearances and is the one that's been consistent for them with effort and also putting his head over the footy all year, and, and that was a mistake and, and something they need to rectify in the off-season. Let's get to our Amy Clangers now. Who covers Clangers? Amy does. And Kane, when it's your day, it's your day. Have a look at this. Charlie Kerno kicked 10 against West Coast. He meant to pass this off to his teammate, David Cunningham, and it's gone through for one of the luckiest goals nuts. you'll ever see. Absolutely nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that sums up. He he one, one clip of West Coast year. <laughs> That, that is. He shanks it. The guy in the goal square falls over and it rolls through for a goal. And Riley West also, speaking of shanks, he shanked that, but straight to his teammate, and that leads to a goal. Now, you know what he gets out of that? He gets a score involvement, <laughs> would you believe? A shank left foot kick leads to a Riley West score involvement. Absolutely bizarre, but the Western Bulldogs will take it. They certainly will. As will Tom Libertoy, who was lying on the deck there, got the handball out to Jamara for that goal. He was one of the best at Marvel Stadium on Friday night as the Western Bulldogs got the job done against Essendon. 36 disposals, 22 contested with 12 clearances. So it was their midfield that responded. So they were flat in the first quarter. I, I thought they allowed uh, Essendon to take far too many uncontested marks. And the Bombers' midfield were, were ready and up for the fight. It was 11-6 to six in clearances in the first quarter. From then on... Bontempelli and Libertora absolutely smashed uh, Essendon around the ball. Mm. So they got a hold of Merritt, they got a hold of Parrish, they got a hold of Hobbs, and I think it was 45 to 15 after quarter time in the clearances. And this man was the reason behind that. So 36 touches, 22 contested, 12 clearances. He had eight score involvements. Um, and it's the easy thing to say that he's in all Australian yeah. form, but he is. Far too often he's overlooked because of how many good midfielders mm. there are in the game, including his skipper, yep. Marcus Bontempelli, who I thought was the best player on the ground. But 
Libba wasn't far behind him. I think this has to be the year that Tom Libertor makes All-Australian. He has been outstanding. The Western Bulldogs have such an incredible record against Essendon. They've now won nine of their last ten games against the Bombers. They've done it pretty comfortably as well. Yeah, it's not a great record if you are the Bombers. And the Bombers' record against the better top eight sides mm. this year has been an issue for them. Now, there's still an opportunity for them. They're out of the eight at the moment, but their draw is favourable on yep. the one run home. Things will have to go right. But, yeah, I, I was disappointed with particularly their work around stoppage yep. and the way that they started the game was impressive, but after that it was, it was a pretty ordinary game. It was a pretty lethargic performance from the Bombers. Let's get to some behind the goals, Fisher, and it really just takes you through this. So we'll start with Cody Waitman here. He's matched up against Andrew McGrath at centre-half back. They start at the exact same starting position. And by the time Cody Waitman kicks this goal, he's put 20, 25 metres on Andrew McGrath. We'll show you a couple of these, Kane, yeah. because this was the story throughout the entire night. So McGrath's had a solid year. He had a poor night, both with ball in hand and also defensively there. That, that's just not good enough for a senior player, and, and Waitman's legs got the better of him there. So Bontempelli wins the footy mm. across half-back. This is, if not the best player in the game, he's in the top three best players in the game. Look at the square of bull, uh, Bombers players around him, and they allow him to run inside forward 50 with not one person on him. He wins it across half-back. He wins it in the forward 50 and kicks a freak goal because mm. not one Essendon player went anywhere near him. So the lack of respect, lack of work rate was alarming for, for Brad Scott. And this one was Adam Trelaw just to finish this off. So again, his opponent's right next to him at the start of the play. In the space of three seconds, he puts 15, 20 metres on his man, gets an easy handball receive here and kicks a really comfortable goal. Mm. So Brad Scott spoke about after the game, they looked a little bit tired, a little bit lethargic. Clear to see there. Do you reckon they moved the ball a bit too slow as well? Yeah, I thought they had control in the first quarter, as I said. But mm. in the end, what the Western Bulldogs were able to do was able to shut that down. And yeah. they still allowed a high number of uncontested marks. I think they took 136 marks, and a lot of those were Kelly and Ridley and, mm -hmm. and these players behind the ball. But it didn't go anywhere after quarter time. And uh, credit to the Western Bulldogs, who have been ordinary for a long time defensively. I thought they were switched on and, and shut that Bombers ball movement down. And, and Ridley's a worry with that quad yeah. as well. That looked like a nasty one. We don't see too many quads these no. days, but it's at least four, probably six, you would think, and um, you know, in danger of missing the rest of the home and away season. It's very worrying for Essendon. Jordan Ridley's been incredibly important for them for a long period of time. Now, let's head to Marvel Stadium today, where Carlton defeated West Coast, and that's where we'll find our Saturday star. It could only be one man, Charlie Kerno, the first player since Plugger Lock at 1994 to kick back-to-back -back hauls of nine-plus goals against the one side. He kicked 10 today from 20 touches and eight marks. Yeah, it is, and we, we'll celebrate this because it's great to see a player kick 10. We saw Taylor Walker do it against West Coast a few weeks ago. But then what this is doing to the competition, and I speak about the West Coast Eagles, is not great. So those that get to play the Eagles twice, and that's going to be Walker and Kerno, are clearly going to have the running for the Coleman medal. So, yep, he was terrific, but once again, second player to kick 10 goals against the Eagles this year, and he also kicked a bag of nine. It's not great for the integrity, not only of the win-loss for the teams that get them, but also for the significant awards like the Coleman medal. But congratulations, great to see him back in form. His last three or four weeks mm. has been really good. And I thought last week against Port Adelaide, he was excellent. 19 goals in two games against West Coast this season for Charlie Kerno. Carlton are on track to break some records. They're now in the top eight as things stand going into Sunday's fixtures. They became just the third team in VFL, AFL history to win five straight games by 50 or more points. They're also looking to become just the sixth side in the last 100 mm. years to make finals in the same season as lo they're losing six straight. This is an incredible run of form. Oh, it's though. been terrific because mm. uh, there was talk the coach was in trouble. Yeah. He was coaching for his future. So to be able to turn that round on the back of, I think, defensively, but also they've really got that mid midfield yeah. power back. And I thought, you know, there's some average teams in there, but the win against Port Adelaide and the win in Perth against Fremantle was significant. Yeah. That one without Freo was without Ruckman. So um, to turn that around and keep their season alive is good for the game. And yeah. it's great for Michael Voss. I don't think they're going to win by 50-plus on no. Friday night no. against Collingwood. <laughs> and considering they've got some injury concerns as yeah. well, which you're going to take us through. They sure do. So it was a pretty rough day for them despite the big win. So Sam Walsh left the game in the second term with a hamstring injury. He was subbed out of the contest. He looked really sore. Even if it's a minor one, it's still probably three or four weeks, which might yep. take him to the back end of the season. Jack Silvani left the game with a jarred knee. They had Jesse Motloff go, go off the ground with a calf complaint. Alex Chincotta was taken off the ground here for a HIA assessment. He ended up coming back on the field, but he looked pretty dazed. Let's not forget Patrick Cripps missed this game with a corked 
calf. Yep. Uh, they also had Adam Chera out with a hamstring injury. They had Jack Martin out. They had Harry Mackay out. So the injuries are really piling up with five games to go in the season. Which is going to make it hard for them when they come up against the good sides, which will happen towards mm. the back half of the year, and it starts on Friday night. Just a word on West Coast. Luke Shuey does his hammy again, yeah. so his future would be in question, and surely it is time for the club to say, we need to move him on, we need mm. to move past Hearn, we have to move past Gaff. Surprising they signed McGovern because he's injured for a couple of weeks. So Yo's the one that breaks down. Nat Nui, they need to move past. But to give up 14 scoring shots and 20 inside 50s in the first quarter again yeah. and game over 10 minutes into that game, something has to change at the Eagles. And I'll keep saying it, no coach in world sports survives a win-loss record like that. Now, they keep being stubborn with that, but this club needs a circuit breaker. And whether that happens at the end of the year, whether it happens this week, I don't know. But something significant has to change at that club because what it's doing to the competition is, is horrific, really. Let's head to our ladder now, Kane, where the Blues are in the top eight, remarkably, given all they've been for this year. As are Richmond, it's really starting to hot up. Collingwood now two games clear in first spot. The race for second spot's interesting mm. as well. I mean, Port Adelaide's draw is tough. They've got the showdown this week, 50-50 game, then they go to Geelong for to play Geelong in Geelong, and Brisbane have got Gold Coast next week. So that top two spot is vital. All their focus has been on probably four to 13. Yeah. And Adelaide's last opportunity to keep their season alive, particularly with Sydney winning, happens tomorrow, which we'll get to against Melbourne. But the top four and the positioning of that mm. now becomes really fascinating and Brisbane hot on the heels of Port Adelaide. It's going to be a huge last five weeks. It's going to be a huge Sunday of action as well. That's where we find our remaining game, starting in Canberra, where GWS takes on Gold Coast. Melbourne hosts Adelaide at the MCG. That's going to be a big game. And then the twilight match to finish us off, St Kilda against North Melbourne. Yeah, so the, the, the game we focus on there, I think, is the middle game, the mm. MCG. Melbourne can probably finish Adelaide's season yeah. tomorrow with a win, which most would expect. But I think Adelaide, if they can bring what they brought at the start with that fierce intensity to get after the opposition, you can restrict Melbourne to score. So if they can keep Melbourne to around that 75, 80 point mark, mm. I think Adelaide are going to be in that game tomorrow. All right, plenty more to come on afl.com.au over the course of the week. Don't forget, access all areas on Monday. Gettables back on Wednesday. Inside trading on Thursday. We will see you next week on The Round so far. Nice job, Kane. See you, mate.